all. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Francis Jisasa. Dr. Francis Jisasa is a university distinguished research professor of chemistry as well as material science and engineering at the University of North Texas, shortly called as UNT, 1010 USC. He completed his BSc and MSc degree from University of Mysore with gold medal for, for securing first rank. He, then he applied his PhD degree in 1992 from Indian of Science, Bangalore, and postdoctoral studies at the University of Houston and the University of Dijon, France. In 1994, he joined as a faculty at the Department of Chemistry, Wichita State University, Kansas. In 2011, he moved to University of North Texas. He received several honors and awards. I would like to mention a few. Toulouse Research Toulouse Scholar Award for the Excellence in Teaching and Research by University of North Texas, Dorothy Research Award by American Chemical Society, Fulbright Specialist Scholar by U.S. Department of State, Fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, <coughs> Fellow of Electrochemical Society, UNT Distinguished Professor, Invited JSBS Fellow, and Young Faculty Scholar Award by Vista State University. Professor Disosa research covers wide areas of chemistry, nanophotonics, and material science. He mainly works on supramolecular chemistry of photosynthesizer, carbon nanomaterials for energy harvesting and photovoltaics, and nanocomposite hybrid materials for energy storage. He has published 400 plus articles in reputed journals, having H index of 69 with 16,700 public citations. I cordially invite Professor Francis to deliver his lecture on carbon nanomaterials for light adversity, where the science and engineering meet. Please. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Francis for the kind invitation. I had a wonderful day today, talking to chemistry faculty and interacting with students. So maybe I'll come out and Yes, because the campus is simply great, and the guest house is fantastic. Okay, so with that, so uh, I would like to thank all of you for being here, simply because you know it's Diwali, uh, day before Diwali, I think. So everybody wanted to go back home, but uh, some people were forced to stay here for this talk. I apologize. So, but anyhow, so what I'm going to do is. Uh, give an overview of our journey in making energy harvesting materials based on carbon nanomaterials. Okay, so the, the idea behind this is shown here. This slide summarizes. This slide summarizes. Oh, thanks. So the idea here is uh, simply look at this uh, picture here. So this is the total global non-renewable energy sources we have, which amounts to about 900 terawatts. So these are non-renewable in the sense once you use up this thing, so we do not have any energy left. So to combat that situation, we have to look at what are the renewable energy sources we have. So if you look at this big yellow circle. So this is how much solar energy we receive. It's about 23,000 terawatts. And wind energy is about 25 to 70 terawatts. So these are renewable energies. And if you ask how much here we need, which is about 16 to 17 terawatts per year. So having said that, if you, if you, you know, if you harvest about 2 to 3 percent of what reaches on the earth,
and in the presence of sunlight, so they make sugar. Sugar is energy, basically, and it releases oxygen that we breathe. Okay, so how to make this? Process in the laboratory and make devices, bring technology to picture and mass produce all these energy materials, or at least convert sunlight into electricity by using this concept. So if you want to do this, so first you need to understand basically what exactly goes in green plants and bacteria. Okay, so if you take a closer look, this is how these are the two important components that we see. One is the cyclic ring, which is called antenna molecular system. So antenna is all these green things are all chlorophyll mixed, and this red is all keratinized and something. The role is to take in or capture sunlight and funnel that and then channel that to something called a reaction center. Now at this reaction center, so there is a bacterial chlorophyll or chlorophyll diamond, we excite that because this light shines on that, it gets excited, and this excited diamond undergoes photon induced electron transfer. And there is electron hopping from one acceptor to another, finally separating the charge separated state. So in a sense, in a sense, if you look at the energetics here, okay, so this is how it looks. So we have vector chlorophyll, which is having about 1.4 electron volt but just shining the light. Then you have initial charge separated state. Charge separated means the electron transfer product, where the donor, that is this guy lost an electron, and this guy accepted that electron. That's why you have a positive charge and a negative charge. And then there is electron hopping. So this electron has to be known, then be known B. Finally it is, I know, as far as very far from this place to this place. So why we need that electron hopping? If both the can and anion are very close, <coughs> the charge recombines. If it recombines, you do not simply have enough time to harvest that energy. So we want to keep them as far as possible so that they do not come recombine. But it comes at the cost of some energy. Because every step costs energy, and the result 1.4 electron volt becomes 0.5 electron volt. So we we'll lose some amount of energy. But what was 10 nanosecond, nanometer is to minus 9 to the second, so we stabilize the charge of the state for about one second. So to summarize this thing, so two important things we see. So there's multi-step electron transfer, and we do get lovely electron transfer or charge separated product. So the question is, how to mimic that? And a cartooning fashion. This is how it looks. So you have a bunch of chlorophyll molecules, they capture sunlight, transfer that energy to a reaction center where there is electron transfer, which ends up in producing the terminal electron acceptor, which is called pinol. And this pinol, with the help of proton, converts ADP, that is adenine diphosphate, to adenine triphosphate, that is the energy unit. So if you want to mimic this and harvest energy, actually we do not care this part of that. All I want is to support the chance of the state and make the charge to move into the circuit. Flow of electrons is nothing but electricity. So basically I'm using such a device or such a molecular system and take some light as an input and generate electricity. That is one goal. Or if you do not like electricity, you can make fuel. Okay, so that is the overall idea. So with that in mind. So what is that we are looking for? So we want to build molecular system or engineer molecular system that can mimic photosynthetic system processes. For that
So can we make and produce molecular systems which can produce high energy gas at the state? So that is the goal. That is our first goal. And second goal is stabilize the charge separated state. Okay, nature does long in charge separated by electron hopping. The question is, can we make molecular system that can exactly mimic such a process without losing much of an energy? Okay? And then, you know, in the photosynthetic system, there's anton, and there's the reaction center. Anton captures the energy. Right? And the reaction center undergoes electron constant. Can we build molecular systems which can do both the processes? Okay, capture energy and then create a charge separated state. Afterwards, where the technology meets, okay, like the title says. So, if all these things are fulfilled, can you create devices, at least prototype devices, which will convert light to electricity? That is the first part. And light to fuel. <coughs> you do not want electricity and night time you need something else. So can we make fuel by just using this concept? And if you did make fuel, can you build devices which will convert that fuel back to electricity? Because the entire our life, our civilization depends upon what flows in the circuit. No electricity, there is no life, pretty much. Uh, there is no internet, there is no life. One of the two. Right? First we started with electricity, now it's internet. But anyhow, so our idea is that, so can we take this grand challenge, okay, and first do fundamental science, then if all the questions are answered, then bring technology into the future and combine them and see whether we can at least build prototype devices to showcase such a effect. Okay, so in choosing donor acceptance, okay. So donor acceptance. So the donor means we need photosensitizers. That means you shine light, this molecule gets excited, the excited molecule has more energy than that in the ground state. That means it is ready to give an electron. Okay? So we generally use phosphorus, that some of you are already aware here, and thalocyanins. Okay, these are great photosensitizers. And then we have carbon-based materials because we are having carbon problem. So our idea is to tackle carbon carbon issues. Maybe you should use electron acceptor derived from carbon. Okay. Yes. Sir. When the um, <coughs> molecules get excited by absorbing the photon, why it will give the electron? Because it has high energy. But it will be excited by emitting a photon. Yes. If, yeah. If there is nothing else. So it will come back to the ground state by giving the photon or by just by giving heat. But in the presence of an electron acceptor, so it can induce an electron to the acceptor, giving a charge separated state. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay, very good. So now this is the idea here. So we use this kind of photosensitizers and this kind of electron acceptors, and then we build molecular systems now. It's fairly complicated, but you know, I can walk it through. So I have a donor, I have an acceptor, okay, they either they are covalently or supramolecularly assembled. And on the donor side, so I have other molecules like antenna systems, where you shine light on them, there's energy transfer, then there is electron transfer. Okay, so that is the overall goal of this first part of the talk. Okay, so with that in mind. Okay, on the acceptor part. So what you 
we have so you can get this out here for a food. You can excite this also. So it gets excited, but this process is not possible. However, this half fit orbiter can transfer an electron from the whole molecule of this and get the same thing. So what it means, no matter where you shine light, no matter where you shine light, you end up getting the same radical unknown pair. It can end better problem. Okay, so no matter where you shine light, so I end up in getting a charge separated state. So having said that, let's take one chip and see how we want the electron transfer because it is easier said than we prove. To prove that electron transfer, so first we need to have a dollar acceptor. I said phosphorus are a great molecule, then we go and we lead with the acceptor like C16. <coughs> so I have a dollar acceptor. Okay, so now how do I know this is the dollar with this acceptor? Basically, you can do electrochemistry and measure the redox potentials. And based on the redox potential, you can establish which one is the donor and which one is the acceptor. If that fails, okay, and if you have computational resources, if you have computational resources, so you can basically optimize the structure and generate the functional orbitals. <coughs> so here the homo is on the popping, lumo is on the acceptor, full ring. So that constitutes, this is a dollar acceptor pair. Now the next question I have is, can I characterize this electron transfer product spectroscopically? To do that, to do that, we have two important instruments. One is a nanosecond flash photolysis. And another is femtosecond flash photolysis. So any photochemical event that takes place from femtosecond all the way to second, we can want. Okay? So that is the idea. So with that, so we start studying transient absorption of this compound. This is the spectrum we get with respect to time. So 5 picoseconds, 20 picoseconds, and about 100 uh, picoseconds. Now, I need to characterize these things. Okay, what is this peak 2 to? What is this peak 2? That is another task. So for that, what we do? A to a donor, that is this guy. And you know where you can oxidize that. Then you apply that potential and record the spectrum. That's called spectroelectrochemistry. And if that gives this peak, then I know it is the carrot peak. And if you have an electron acceptor, <coughs> do the same thing by applying the reduction potential and see where the reduction product of this comes, if it has a peak around this, so that is the C60 anion radical. So, once you have that, so I identified carrier radical, anion radical, and because this is recorded with respect to time, so I can monitor the time profile of this piece, I can monitor the time profile of this piece, okay, and from there, I can calculate how far the charge suppression takes place, how fast the charge recombination takes place. Okay. So when it says it's about 0.4 picoseconds, very fast, because being 10 to minus 2, and in about 15 picoseconds, everything is done. So if you look at this molecular structure, they're very close. Okay, they undergo charge separation just like what you see, but it is not stable because what goes up comes down equally fast. So if you want to make a device out of this, this may not be the ideal case or ideal candidate because this did not stabilize the charge separation state. However, it does undergo charge separation. So we have to think a little differently. And also we are our system we call is a supramolecular chemistry group. So we like self-assembly also. Okay? So here is my goal in which the central zinc is a coordinately unsaturated metal. So that means I can add a ligand or two. So that means electron acceptor also it functions as that such a way that it can coordinate. Or we have different approaches. So crown with the binding to cation, or crown with the cation axial ligation, or hydrogen bonding. All those things we can add. And every time we have a self assembly process, so there are several figures of many. One is how stable the complex is, and what is the quantum rate of electron transfer. And what is the forward electron transfer and reverse electron transfer? This system shows these are all good systems, and it has stabilized the charge separated state to some extent, not a whole lot. Still, it is 
in nanosecond. Okay, so still in the nanosecond range. So with that, so we started playing. So whether the distance and orientation has anything to do. So with that in mind, we decide a molecule of this kind. What we have is covalent often fluid. And then I have actually called it, so this is tail on. So this is a very rigid molecule, just like you have a picture frame with two knees. So it is rigid, you cannot move the frame. But if it is only one, you can swing them. Okay, swinging means, you know, it is not defined. Here it is defined. From there, you can see what is the effect of, you know, distance and orientation in electron transfer. So all these things are true. And if you look at this thing, PRIP. All right, it stands for rest in peace. All in my sense is energy of radical ion K. Okay, so E means radical ion very energy. And this is about 1.3 electron volt. Okay, so in photosynthetic system, I said it's <coughs> not the terminal. So that this is much higher already. However, if you look at the lifetime, it is about one microsecond. There it was second. So that says. Yeah, accomplish something close, but the lifetime is not that great. You have to still work. Okay? So the question was, so can we improve these things? Okay, so can we improve this thing? Hmm. Okay, so with that in mind, so we design a newer molecular system in which is a high oxidation potential donor. Okay, because of the electron withdrawing group. And from there I can measure how much energy it can store. It is about 1.7 electron volt instead of 1.3. So this molecule indeed can you know store or generate high energy charge separated states. And if you look at the transient, so it has the cation, which has anion and cation. From there I have the lifetime measure, which is about 50 to 60 nanoseconds, which is not much. However, this has very high energy for radical ion pair. So we are engineering the system so to accomplish you know, several you know, items or figures of merit that I was telling. Okay, with that, then we I'm going to change the gears instead of fullerene using carbon nanotubes. Okay, so what are carbon nanotubes? <coughs> so if you are looking for single wall carbon nanotubes, if you take a graphene sheet and four. So you have a tube. And there are a lot of applications for that. Okay, and in our case, we are more interested in energy harvesting and storage. Energy harvesting and storage. However, there are problems with nanotubes. What are the problems? When you make nanotubes, synthesize nanotubes, they come in all diameter shapes and sizes. Okay, separation of them is a tedious process. One of the best methods is Non-linear density gradient order simplification from where you can separate nanotubes of different diameter. And this nanotube are great probes. They're photoluminescent and also they emit anywhere between 850 to 400 nanometers. They're all emission of a given individual nanotube. Okay, so we can use these things to build. So this is what I'm showing as you increase, as you increase the size. Okay, these are all transition. And you can say the gap decreases. That's why there's a red shift in the emission. Okay, so once you have this thing, so how, what happens when you excite the nanotube and what happens when you excite the photosensitizer? Because when you have donor acceptor, you have photosensitizer and nanotube. And you have whole volume. There's a conduction band and valence band because the materials kind of system. So when you shine the probe, it gets excited, and then you have electron transfer. That means you can generate a charge separated state. However, if you excite the nanotube, what you have is <coughs> an exciton, electron hole here, and it forms fast and relaxes equally fast. So that means you cannot pump an electron from this either one of the state to this level. So if you want to achieve charge separation using carbon nanotube, so this is the only route or elegant approach. How, and if you want to build donor acceptor, there's another small problem with nanotubes. In nanotubes, all the carbons are sp2. And if you did any chemistry, you convert some of the sp2 
two carbons, the sp3. sp3 is saturated carbon, it's just like wax. So if you have too many sp3 carbons, you totally destroy the electronic properties. As a result, there is no much electron transfer can be seen. So to tackle the problem, what we do, instead of covalent deleting them, we pi stack. So here is my probe, and I have four pyrene entities, and this molecule, nanotube, for some reason, it loves to stick to some other flat aromatic systems. Okay, you mix them, you have a donor acceptor. Uh, you can utilize that approach in different design, or if you do not like all organic, so you can use single-stranded DNA, that wraps around the nanotube, then use a water soluble porphyrin, ionic <coughs> and see electron transfer. And if you know good enough synthetic chemistry, you can do this chemistry, okay, you can do this chemistry by, you know, adding a functionalizing a limited number of photosensitizers so that there is not total, the electronic structure is not totally destroyed. So this is Prado's reaction, it's you know, motion of coupling approach. So we are different donor acceptors <coughs> and we are shown electron transfer between these two. However, when you have double bond carbon nanotubes or multiple carbon nanotubes, generally you don't see electron transfer because the exothermic that you form is totally rapidly conscious everything. Okay? So that is as far as nanotube is concerned. How about using graphene? Okay, so graphene, as you know, so it is a great material. Somebody got a Nobel Prize for that. A lot of papers appeared in science and nature. And look at the high surface area, electric conductivity, all those things. However, if you want to use this as an energy material, if you want to use this as an energy material, the bad news is it's a zero band gap material. And if you want to do donor acceptor, there should be a band gap. Or more type of thing. So this is the uh, this is the electronic band gap. So there is zero band gap. However, when they do graphene on a substrate, okay, so there was a split, there was a small band gap opening about one point one electron volt. That was enough for chemists to know that there is a way to open the band gap by just placing a receptor that was sticky. So we can stick that also. So with that means, we have to make molecules which has the ability to pi stack. So with that we will make this thalassine with 4 pi in it stands. And it forms a very nice monoxide acceptor kind of pair. However, if this is the absorption, this is the fluorescence that shows the reaction <coughs> and quenching, and this is the transient absorbance. So because these are so close now, pi stack, so you have very fast charge separation and equally fast charge recombination. So at least we found the approach, but the material is not that great if you are talking about making energy transfer systems. Okay, so we change the approach in later. So instead of just using a pyrene and the probe, we put at least a subtle sign it with C60 like this and pyrene, then it attached like this. Okay, now we shine light on this and study electron transfer. So in this case, we have electron transfer and we have stabilized the charge of it state to some extent. To some extent. Okay, so, so moving forward, now I said, well, can we make long lived charge of it state by electron hop? Okay, because electron hopping is a very important process. So nature does that very elegantly. So our ideas can be mimic nature in this case. So with that in mind, so we designed a beautiful molecule. What I have is a central photosensitizer. And then I have a ferrocene in it here. Ferrocene is easier to oxidize compared to this guy. It's all electronics. Okay? And I have C60 like this, it can coordinate at the point here. So once I have this, so if I this is the optimal structure. Okay, and then if I shine light, so there is electron transfer, then there is hole transfer. Okay, so and if I look at all the figures of merit in this case, okay, figures of merit in this case, what I see, so because of, you know, the cation stays here and then stays here now, we separate the charge of respect, charge recombination is slow. So now 
Now I have about seven microseconds. So we started with picoseconds. Now we have microseconds. So it's about six orders of magnitude. We slow down the process of charging combination. The question is, can you do it better? Because nature did one second, but we really don't want one second. We want at least a millisecond type of thing. So with that in mind, we make a sample. Okay, so there is oxophorphenogen and this is the porphyrin. This is a CCC point like this. You shine light. So this is the this is the figures of merit. Not much in terms of charge stabilization. However, in this molecule there are these two protons which can bind anions. They bind anions. Once it points anion, this becomes very easy to oxidize. Then this becomes a whole transparent agent. As a result, this is a CCC radical. Look at that. Stays forever. It's about 14 microseconds. What was nano becomes micro. Okay, so we were very much fascinated. Then we built maybe bigger is better. So we build a randomly molecule like this, then put C60 and we study it. Once you shine light, it undergoes electron transfer, and that whole migrates throughout this popular ring. As a result, you slow down the charge recombination process significantly, and finally you have. A lifetime of close to a millisecond. So millisecond means now it is nine orders of magnitude. It took about a dozen years to accomplish. Okay. <coughs> so that means we are very close to what in terms of mimicking nature is stabilizing the charge of the state. Okay, so with that, so the last topic I have under this umbrella is whether we can build more which can show both antenna and reaction center effect. That is one photon, two photochemical events you should be able to see. So for that, you have to build molecules. Such an effect, you know, you have two entities. So one is simple body P, right? Another is bisterile body P. Because this is a pi conjugate system, this absorbs and emits in the red compared to this guy. And the absorption and the emission is complementary. If you fulfill all these conditions, you shine light, there should be energy transfer to this. Then this gets excited, and then there is an electron transfer. So basically, I'm using one photon to excite molecule somewhere. Ultimately, I have charge separation from the other part of the molecule, just like what nature does. So I have to prove by some mechanism. So this is a steady state, the body, that part is one, and this part is enhanced. That keeps it so there is energy transfer. Okay, so then I can study basically. Okay, so this is the energy transfer. One gives off energy, other gains energy. From there, I have rates for energy transfer. And after putting C60, there's a C60P. From there, I can calculate electron transfer. Basically, what I'm going to show if you design the molecule such a way that you know you excite the molecule in one part. You will end up getting charge separate star in the other part of the molecule. So, <coughs> we have built a lot of molecules of this nature. I'm not going through all the details. We have built a lot of molecules for a period of time, including near IR probes and uh, such like this. So, basically, these are all probes which emits the near IR. Why near IR? Because most of the solar spectrum, solar devices that we see, they cover only the visible portion. Yeah, I'll tell you about 700 nanometers. Because, but the solar energy until 1100 nanometers can be used to make electricity. However, we do not have the materials or molecules okay, which undergo electron transfer or photovoltaic effect in that range. So there is a great demand to show that kind of molecules. Here is a small series of compounds where it emits, absorbs, and emits in the near IR. And there is another set of molecules that also absorbs and emits the near IR. Then we can put C60 like this and study electron transfer. So we devised molecules not only for visible region, for the entire near IR portion of the electron and its spectrum. So once you have this, so we can build molecules where, so you have antenna system, charge stabilizing system, and electron acceptor. Basically, what I'm going to show you here. You shine light, energy transfer, then electron transfer, then old transfer. So in one system I can accomplish everything. 
Okay, so this kind of systems you have built. And also we can build these things in vertical fashion. I'm not going through all the details, simply that thing. So once you have this, so now I know how to make the molecules. Okay? Now I know how to control the kinetics of electron transfer and stabilize the charge of the state. And also I know how to extend the optical window, not only to visible, to near IR portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So I know it is have good control. And the question is, can I employ such system to make devices which will at least convert part of the sunlight into electricity? Okay, so with that, so we have this, so it's a complicated process, <coughs> basically, so the way it works, the way it works is shown here, so you have to accept it, you shine light, one of the guys gets excited, it undergoes electron transfer, and assume the acceptor is on a transparent electrode, position this way, so that after electron transfer, this electron, which is on the acceptor, can move in the circuit, the okay, movement of electrons is nothing but electricity, we all know that. And by using the redox mediator, we can complete the circuit. So this is just like red cell cell, but instead of one sensitizer there, we use a donor acceptor system. That's the only difference. So the first system we develop is shown here. Basically, I have a polypeptide with offering and C60, the <coughs> electrophoretically deposit on transparent electrodes, build the solar cell, and record the IV curves, record the IV curves. So this is what I have shown here. So this energy diagram, so this is the current scanning, and this is the potential switching. So it produces both current and voltage. And if you look at this, a small number, but it's a small cell. If you connect them in series and parallel, you can generate any potential or any current, just like any photovoltaic device does. And this thing is not very efficient. So we wanted to make it a little more efficient. So for that lately, so we are involved in making... What is the efficiency of this cell? Uh, it's about 10%. 10%? 10%. 8 to 10% in general. Okay, so that's what I want to show. But anyhow, so we, we can do that. Uh, uh, Lately, we use push pull buffers like instead of this, so they are even better. That's also Professor Shankar from this uh, institution involved with us in developing such molecular systems. Okay, so we know how to make a kernel of light with electricity, and most of the time it is 7, 8, 9 percent. That's the highest we can get. Okay, so now using the same concept, instead of electricity, can we make fuel? Fuel being you know, so every time anybody says fuel, so we, the picture comes into our mind is can we split water? Split water, okay, to create oxygen and protons and reduce those protons to hydrogen. So this is the fuel everybody is looking after. To make that, you need a photo catalyst such as this, in which we have water oxygen catalyst connected to this donor and a proton reduction catalyst to this side. Okay, you shine light, you get the charge separator state, and that potential drives this. Okay, you split water, and this electron moves because there's a cation, and that electron moves here, and it involves in reducing protons to hydrogen. So, many people are working on this, at least 200 uh, groups on the planet. However, one of the problems with hydrogen is storage. Right? So, and it's explosive. So our idea is maybe we should not go after a fuel which is in the gas phase. Maybe we should think about something which is liquid. So among all the things we came up with this, and this is done with uh, Professor Fukushima of Osaka University, is you know, in collaboration with, the, with him. So what we have is the same photocatalytic system that I've been talking, and same water oxidation catalyst. But in this side, instead of proton reduction catalyst, <coughs> I have an oxygen reduction catalyst. The idea is these protons you generate, they react with oxygen, and this catalyst converts them by two electrons to hydrogen peroxide. So in essence, what I'm trying to do, I take water and oxygen, water from here, oxygen from there, use 
sunlight and may turn into rock cell. So there is plenty of sunlight, there is plenty of water, it has been raining here heavily. There is some oxygen still. Okay, so we can use that to make hydrogen peroxide. And that is the idea. And if you look at this, this sign, okay, so this is how it looks. So H type of cell that all electrochemists know. This is a photo anon where our catalyst is deposited. And this is a cathode where such a catalyst for two electron detection of oxygen is deposited. You shine light and water gets oxidized, protons move to a thin membrane, electrons flow here, and this oxygen, this hydrogen with oxygen, in the presence of protons, they produce hydrogen peroxide. So overall net reaction is oxygen reacting to water to give hydrogen peroxide with light as the source. So we have made this, we have done a lot of it. What are these semiconductors which you are using for? Here in this case, the donor acceptor we can use. Or to begin it, we can use bismuth vanadate. Okay, that is a better catalyst. So all our studies we use bismuth vanadate or antimony oxide. They are better. Adjoining in which region? Adjoining in which region? They are about 500 nanometers. Five it's bismuth vanadate, so it's a very narrow region. But if you use our systems, they go on to 900,000 nanometers. So here are this. Now again, these are our systems. We have photosensitizers. And this is the word oxidation catalyst. More basically, right now we are more focused on ruthenium based because they are very well known. And once you have that, you know, so we can start studying their properties. And now we have systems which will produce about 4 to 5 percent conversion in about 4 to 5 hours of irradiation. It's not great. Okay, at least the prototype gives 4 to 5 percent hydrogen peroxide, a minimal concentration of hydrogen peroxide after about 4 or 5 hours of continuous irradiation. So now we know how to make fuel in a high concentrated, you know, okay type. Now can we use that fuel and convert back electricity? Because hydrogen peroxide is good, but we cannot use that unless you create electricity out of that. And if you look at the redox in which have this compound, hydrogen peroxide, the redox has to both anodic side and cathodic side. So, Anodic side, if you oxidize this, you get water, uh, oxygen. Cathodic side, if you reduce that, you get water. This is the potential, this is the potential, and if you add up these things, so you should have at least one mole. If you build a fuel cell, it should have one mole, 1.09 one volt generated. And what are the end products? You started with hydrogen, started with water and oxygen to the hydrogen peroxide. You are using hydrogen peroxide, getting back again what you started with. So, you are getting back your oxygen and water. Provided you could build this fuel cell. So, to build the fuel cell, this is basically that. Okay, so there is an anode, there is a cathode, cathode need a catalyst, and those are chemists, they know we use Prussian blue catalyst here, and this is nickel based this thing. And if you look at the IV curve, this is a power plot, this shows about 0.9 instead of 1.09 under this condition. 0.9, and if you look at it, because it's the same compound, both sides, you really don't need a PEM, proton exchange membrane in this case. Okay? So, to, just to make sure that it is true, so what we did, so we made a thing, so what you see here is LED. Okay? And this LED means, a potential of a 2.4 volt. If one of these cells produces only 0.9, to lift this I need 3 at least. So I have 3 fuel cells connected in series and so I have a feature if you just click on this, maybe it will work. Okay, so now this is one of these electrodes and my student is dipping there. Okay, it's a very simple construction. So you have light. So Fuel cell is working. So these are all hydrogen peroxide. Say about 2-3% hydrogen peroxide. That's good enough. If it is very co high constant hydrogen peroxide, it explodes. Okay, this itself is good. And you have hydrogen peroxide produced. So, basically where the challenge part is now. Okay, so, do we know this? Yes. Do we know this? To control this? Yes. Do we know this? Yes. Big means? Yes, yes. Small means? Now technology should be better and more efficient. So that is where our next effort, the next few years before I retire, 
Okay, but focus yes. on how to make these things much more efficient because we, we have made a great amount of progress in this uh, area of research and also we have shown this is possible. Okay, so using artificial photosynthetic approach, we can make electricity, we can make fuel and convert the fuel back to electricity as needed. Okay, with that, I would like to stop here. Let me say, let me thank my group. This is my present group. And this is about eight years ago. And some of them already graduated and have new faces to fill in. No time to take a new picture. But anyhow, this is almost recent. And we do collaborate with a number of people across the globe, including Professor Shankar from IT Group team. And much of our uh, funding comes from initially from NSF. And now, because it's fuel cell, they get fuel light, and now they just start doing money, Department of Energy, and UNT, that's my institution, they invest a lot of money uh, in me to set up this uh, <coughs> With that, I would like to thank again all of you for being here, and I'm very happy to answer any 